In this video, we'll talk about graphs of polynomial functions. In particular, we'll talk about how to sketch a graph of a polynomial function. When we talk about a polynomial function, we mean one that has general form that you see here. That is, f at x is equal to a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1, and so on until you get to the end, a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a sub 0. These a sub n terms, a sub n, a sub n minus 1, a sub 2, and so on, these are the coefficients of the polynomial function. They can be any real number, including 0, except for the leading term. The leading term must have non-zero coefficient, because the leading term will tell you the degree. The degree of the polynomial function is the largest power, the largest power that appears, and so it must be associated with a coefficient which is non-zero. So what we want to do is sketch a graph of this polynomial function. Emphasis here on sketch. This won't be an exact graph. It will just give you some idea of the general properties. In particular, we'll be looking for the local properties and the end behavior. In order to sketch the graph of a polynomial, we'll follow these steps. First, we'll determine the y-intercepts. Then, we'll determine the x-intercepts. We'll determine the multiplicities of the x-intercepts. We'll determine the end behavior based on the leading term. And then we'll draw a smooth curve connecting the intercepts from steps 1 and 2 in a way that is cons consistent with steps 3 and 4. We'll talk more about all of these steps. First, we determine the y-intercept. The y-intercept of a function is the place on the graph where it intersects the y-axis. The y-axis is where x is equal to 0. So if you want to compute the y-intercept of a graph, you look at the place where x is equal to 0. Since the graph is the graph of a function, the y-coordinate is given by f evaluated at 0. We're looking at a very specific type of function, which is a polynomial function. And you can see an example here of a degree n polynomial function. And it's just like before, f at x equals a sub n x to the n, and so on until you get to a sub 1 times x plus a sub 0. If we evaluate this at x equals 0, if you put an x equals 0 in there, then all of these x terms will be equal to 0, and they'll all disappear. And the only thing left will be this a 0 term. So the y-intercept is the constant term, a sub 0. So it's quite easy to determine the y-intercept of a polynomial function, provided it's written in the general form. Let's talk about these notes. The domain of a polynomial function is the set of all real numbers. What that means, is, in particular, is that 0 is in the domain of the function. So there always is a y-intercept. But not only is there always a y-intercept, a y there's always exactly one of them there cannot be more than one y-intercept. If there were two y-intercepts, then the graph would intersect the y-axis twice. The y-axis is a vertical line. So if the graph intersected a vertical line more than once, then the function would fail to satisfy the vertical line test, and then it wouldn't be a function at all. And that's a contradiction. What that means is that there can be only one y-intercept. So there must be one, and there can be only one. We also want to determine the x-intercepts. The x-intercepts are the points where the graph intersects the x-axis. The x-axis is where y is equal to zero. That's the output. So the x-intercepts of the graph are the points of the form x comma f at x, where f at x, the output, is equal to 0. f at x is y, so y is equal to 0. So we want to find the points on the graph where the y-coordinate is 0. 
But that's just the output f at x, so we just need to find the places where f at x is equal to 0. So to find the x-intercepts, we find the values of x for which f at x equals 0. These are called the zeros of the function. A function may have many zeros, but it's possible that it has none. This is an important fact about polynomial functions. If x equals c is a zero of a polynomial function, so that f at c is equal to zero, that means that x minus c is a factor of the polynomial. So if you have all of the factors, then you can read off all of the zeros just by looking at where all of the factors equal zero. Here's an example. Here's a polynomial which has already been factored for convenience. f at x equals the quantity x plus 3 squared times x plus 1 times the quantity x minus 2 cubed times x minus 4. So x plus 3, that quantity is squared, and x minus 2, that quantity is cubed. So this is a degree 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1 polynomial because these linear terms here are degree 1. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is a degree 7 polynomial. If we were given this in general form, it might be difficult to factor. That's why it's given to us already factored for our convenience. The zeros of this polynomial are precisely the places where the factors are zero. So in order to find the zeros, we set this equal to zero. And we can see that this is going to be equal to zero when one of the factors is equal to zero. So the first factor is equal to zero at x equals negative three. The second factor is equal to zero when x is equal to negative one. The third factor is equal to zero when x is equal to two and the fourth one is equal to zero when x is equal to four. These four x values are the zeros of the polynomial function. f at x is equal to zero when x is equal to negative three, or x is negative one, or x is two, or x is four. So x can't be equal to all of these at the same time. The polynomial function is zero when x is any one of these four. Now if you look at the graph, you'll see that these zeros of this polynomial correspond exactly to the intercepts of the graph, the x-intercepts. So we have our first one, our, when I say our first one, I mean the one farthest to the left is x equals negative three. x equals negative three. That is a zero of our polynomial, and it's also the x-coordinate of an x-intercept. Then we have x equals negative one, which is right here. Again, it's an intercept. Our next zero is x equals two, and that is also an intercept, an x-intercept. Finally, we have x equals four, and that's an intercept as well. This is a degree seven polynomial. That means it's odd. So the end behavior is that on one side, it'll go off to infinity, and on the other side, it'll go to negative infinity. Since the coefficient here, the leading coefficient is positive, that means it goes off to infinity as x moves to the right, and you can see that in the graph. And it goes to negative infinity as x goes to the left, which you can also see in the graph. So the graph has four x-intercepts, and these are exactly at the zeros of the polynomial function. Notice that the factor x plus 3 appears twice. x plus 3 appears twice. That means that the zero has what we call multiplicity two. Multiplicity two. It's called multiplicity two because it appears twice. X minus two appears three times. X minus two appears three times. So X equals two is a zero that has multiplicity three. In the graph, this is represented by the behavior at the X intercept. For example, X equals negative three is a zero of multiplicity two. If you look at that x-intercept, you'll see that it doesn't actually cross the x-axis. It touches it, but it doesn't pass through. That's because the multiplicity is even. If you have an even multiplicity, it won't cross through the x-axis. It will touch the x-axis and then turn around. 
this factor x minus 2, it appears three times. So x equals 2 has multiplicity 3. In terms of the graph, an odd multiplicity means that the graph will pass through the x-axis, which it does here. But notice that it doesn't pass through as if it's a straight line. So at x equals negative 1, it passes through directly as if it's just a straight line. Same with x equals 4. But at x equals 2, it levels out, it flattens. It flattens out instead of just simply passing through because the multiplicity is 3. In general, we say that a polynomial function, f at x, has a factor x minus c that appears p times if x equals c is a zero of multiplicity p. So f evaluated x gives you a polynomial. And if that polynomial has a factor x minus c that is raised to the power p, then we say that x equals c is a zero of multiplicity p. So we have some examples here. So if it's multiplicity p equals 1, then that means it just passes through. It sort of looks like a line. It's not a line. And you can see that it's curving as, as x moves further to the right. It also curves as x moves further to the left. But at x equals whatever this, this value is, whatever this x-intercept is, as it passes through, it looks quite straight, like a line. And that's because x minus c is equal to 0 here, and that is a line. So x minus c raised to the 1 power looks like a line. On the other hand, if you have multiplicity p equals 2, then that means you're looking at a factor of x minus c quantity squared. And that sort of looks like a parabola, and so that's why you get a parabola here. Now, this isn't actually a parabola, because who knows what it's doing outside. For example, in our graph earlier, x equals minus 3 is a 0 of multiplicity 2. And so at x equals negative 3, it sort of looks like a parabola. This is local behavior. Locally, it looks like a parabola. But it's not a parabola, because as x moves further to the right, it starts turning upwards, and it does all kinds of different things. But locally, nearby, it sort of looks like a parabola. And that's what you have when the multiplicity is 2. If the multiplicity is 3, then your factor looks like x minus c quantity cubed. So it looks like a cubic. And you can see that locally, it looks like a cubic. And again, if we look back at our picture, you can see that locally, it looks like a cubic. It changes behavior very quickly. As you move further to the right, it suddenly turns upwards. As you move to the left, it turns downwards. So it's not a cubic, but locally, it looks cubic. And that's because the multiplicity is p equals 3. In general, a 0 of odd multiplicity passes through the x-axis. But at a 0 of even multiplicity, it touches but doesn't cross it. It just, like this, it will touch it and then turn around. The polynomial that we've been looking at, f at x equals x plus 3 quantity squared times x plus 1 times x minus 2 quantity cubed times x minus 4. This, as we discussed, is a polynomial of degree 7. It has zeros at x equals negative 3, x equals negative 1, x equals 2, and x equals 4. x equals negative 3 has multiplicity 2. And you can see that because it touches the graph but then turns around x minus 1 has multiplicity 1, and you can see that it just simply passes through without flattening out or turning around. x equals 2 has multiplicity 3, so it passes through. This is an odd multiplicity. It passes through, but it levels out a little bit, so it looks like the graph of a cubic locally. x equals 4 has multiplicity 1, so it just passes through. The higher the multiplicity, the flatter the graph becomes at the x-axis. So let's look at this example. f at x equals x plus 1 quantity raised to the 4 times x minus 2 quantity raised to the 5. Notice that this only has two zeros. The zeros are x equals negative 1, so zeros, x equals negative 1, and x equals 2, 
which we've also written down here. So x equals 1 has multiplicity, or x equals negative 1, has multiplicity 4. It's multiplicity 4. It has multiplicity 4 because the factor appears 4 times. So 4 is an even number. What that means is that x equals negative 1, the graph will touch the x-axis, but it won't pass through. And that's what happens here, because it's even. It touches, but it doesn't pass through. Now, x equals 4 is pretty large, so it gets quite flat there. Now, when we say flat, it just looks flat. It's crossing, or not crossing, it's touching the x-axis at x equals negative 1, but nowhere else. So if you got really close, it would look you'd have your x-axis here, and this would be negative 1. And if you got really close, it would be close to the x-axis, like this. But it would only touch, it would only touch at the one spot. So it would look something like, oh, I missed. It would look something like this. But it, that's only if you're really close. It looks flat from far away. Maybe it would look more like that. There we go. So it looks really close, but it actually only touches, it only touches at one spot. Wherever it touches, that's going to give you a y value of 0. And this can only be equal to 0 when x is equal to negative 1 or x is equal to 2. So the other place it touches the x-axis is x equals 2. Now this is an odd number in the exponent. So that means the factor appears an odd number of times, the multiplicity is odd. Since the multiplicity is odd, the graph passes through the x-axis. And since the multiplicity is 5, which is quite high, it gets very flat here. And again, it's only touching the x-axis at 2 and then passing through. It's really close, but it's not a straight line here. It's not completely flat. It's like this one curves slightly. So if we look, if we zoom in, and here's 2, it gets really close and then touches and then passes through, but, well that's actually even worse. Let's try, let's try that again. It gets really close and touches and goes sort of like, sort of like that. But it's flat on both sides, or it's, it's quite flat. So it's coming through here like that. It's just like sort of like that, but it's really flat. It's really close. So this is zoomed and enhanced to, you know, it's really close. Just like here, that's really close. But the moral of the story is simply this. If the multiplicity is even, it touches but doesn't pass through. If the multiplicity is odd, it does pass through. But the higher the multiplicity, the flatter the curve appears. And that's what you need to take away from this slide. Here's a theorem. The sum of the multiplicities of a polynomial is the degree of the polynomial function. When factored completely into linear terms, So if you have the examples like what we've been looking at, so here we have f at x is equal to the product of all of these factors. These are all linear factors. The linear factors are, you know, the x minus c things. x minus c. So in our first example, x plus 3 quantity squared times x plus 1 times x minus 2 quantity cubed times x minus 4, the multiplicities are 2, 1, 3, and 1. So you can think of these as having little 1's here. So the multiplicities are 2, 1, 3, and 1, and the degree of the polynomial is 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1 is 7. Now for this other polynomial that we looked at, x plus 1 quantity raised to the 4 times x minus 2 quantity raised to the 5, it has multiplicities 4 and 5, and if you add those together, you get 9. So this is a degree 9 polynomial. And you can see why that would be true if you started multiplying all of these out, and I wouldn't really recommend it. Here, this is going to contribute, this x plus 1, it appears 4 times. So when you start multiplying them together, you're going to get an x times an x times an x times an x. 
So if we started actually just writing this out, this would be x plus 1 times x plus 1 times x plus 1 times x plus 1, and similarly you'd have x minus 2 would appear 5 times. But rather than write it out, let's just say 5 times. And here you have 4 times. So if you started multiplying all these out, you'd have an x times an x times an x times an x, which is four x's, and here you'd have five more. So if you multiply all those together, you're going to have, as your leading term, you're going to have x times x times x times x, which those these four times, and then five more times. So that's going to give you four plus five, plus other terms. So this is just other stuff. Well, I'll say other terms. This one right here, this is the leading term because it has the most x's. It has an x from each one of these. There's an x there, then an x there, then an x there, and so on. So when you multiply all of those together, you get x to the 4 plus 5. But of course, 4 plus 5 is 9. So the leading term is x to the 9. So this is a degree 9 polynomial. This really only works when you've factored the polynomial completely into these linear terms. If you can't factor it that way, then you wouldn't be able to add together the multiplicities like this. All right, so let's use the graph of the function below to identify the zeros of the function and the possible multiplicities. We won't be able to do it exactly, but we can guess what, it, what they are. At least we can have a try. And then based on that, we can talk about what is the minimum possible degree of the polynomial. So just looking at its overall shape, you know that it's going to be an even degree because of the end behavior. The leading term will be positive, as you can see, because it's opening upwards. And as x goes to the right or to the left, y is increasing without bounds. So this will be an, uh, this, this is a polynomial that will have even degree. Now, we want to figure out what the zeros are. That's just where it crosses the x-axis, or touches. So there, at negative 2, here at negative 1, that's what that one is, and then here at 2, and then here at 6. So the zeros are x equals negative 2, x equals negative 1, x equals 2, and x equals 6. And now, what about the multiplicities? Well, we, we don't know that exactly, but we can guess. So, for example, x equals negative 2, you can see that it's going to have an even multiplicity because it decreases, touches the x-axis, and then turns around. So this is going to have an even multiplicity. It looks kind of like, if you're just looking really close, it looks like a parabola. So this one looks like it probably has multiplicity 2. And what about negative 1? It looks like it's just passing through. It's not flattening at all. So this one's going to have multiplicity 1. For 2, you can see that it's passing through. So that means it's going to have an odd, an odd multiplicity. But it flattens out. It flattens out, so that means it's going to be greater than 1. For x equals negative 1, you can see it's just passing through. It doesn't flatten out at all, so that's why I had multiplicity 1. Here, it flattens out. So it's odd multiplicity greater than 1. The smallest it would be, and we're going to be talking about the minimum possible degree, so the smallest it could be is 3. It's entirely possible that that might be 5, but the smallest is 3. It can't be 1, so it, the smallest it could be is 3. What about, what about this one? x equals 6. Again, this is an even multiplicity because it's not, it's not passing through. It's decreasing. It touches the x-axis, but then it turns around. So it's an even multiplicity, and you can see that it's quite flat there. So it's certainly not multiplicity 2. It's got to be something bigger than that. So since we're talking about what is the minimum possible degree, this is an even multiplicity, which is bigger than 2, so the smallest it could possibly be is 4, because it's an even multiplicity. 
the smallest even multiplicity bigger than 2 is 4. Now again, it might be 6, but it's the smallest one it would, would be 4. So that means the smallest degree, so the smallest possible degree is equal to 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 4, which is 10. So the smallest, the minimum possible degree for this polynomial function is 10. So this is the same, this is the same graph. But now we know that, so it says, if you know that the degree of the polynomial function is 9, but it's not 10. That's what it's supposed to say. So if you know that the degree of the polynomial function in example 5 is 10, and the y-intercept is given to you, write down the formula for the polynomial function. So it might seem like we don't have enough information here, but we actually do. So uh, we know what the zeros are. Negative 2, 2, oh, I missed 1, ne negative 1, and 6. And we know what the minimum multiplicities are. We have the, that written right here. The minimum multiplicities are right there, and they added to 10. That's why I know that the degree of the polynomial function here, well, certainly it has to be even because it's going to, it's increasing to, y is increasing, you know, going off to infinity as x goes to the right or the left. So the degree of the polynomial has to be even. So that was just a typo. So we're, we're given now that, yes, it actually is 10. So these are actually the multiplicities. These are the multiplicities here. Okay, so if we know what the multiplicities are, and let me just write them here, so we know that, uh, let me just say p equals 2, and here we know that p is equal to 1, p is the multiplicity, here p is equal to 3, and here p is equal to 4. So remember that if you have a zero of multiplicity p, that means you have a factor raised to the p. So that means that f at x is going to be equal to some constant times x plus 2 squared. That's, that's for this one. The 0 here is x equals minus 2, and it has multiplicity 2. And now we have this, one, this term, x minus a negative 1 is x plus 1. And this is raised to the 1 power. And then we have this one, so it's x minus 2, and the power is 3, so that's 3, times x minus 6, and here the power is 4. So this is what the polynomial looks like. We know that it has x-intercepts at negative 2, negative 1, 2, and 6. So that gives us the, the factors the intercepts give you the zeros. So x plus 2 corresponds to the intercept at negative 2, the 0 at negative 2. This 0, negative 1 corresponds to x plus 1. This 0 of 2 corresponds to x minus 2. And this 0 of 6 corresponds to x minus 6. The exponents here, the powers, are the multiplicities. This multiplicity is 2, so we have a 2 there. This multiplicity is 3, so we have a 3 there. This multiplicity is 4, so we have a 4 there. This multiplicity is 1, so it's x plus 1 raised to the 1 power, which we don't normally write in. Now what about this k here? This k is necessary, because if I didn't have this k, let me just, let me just get rid of this k. And if I tried to plug in f at 0, that would give me 0 plus 2, squared times 0 plus 1 times 0 minus 2 cubed times 0 minus 6 to the 4. Now this is certainly not going to equal negative 32. So what does it equal? Well, I'm not going to write it out exactly, but this would equal, uh, here's 2 squared and here's negative 2 cubed. So that's going to give us negative 2 to the fifth times, and I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to write all of this out, but minus 6 to the 4, that's the same as 6 to the 4. I'm going to leave it factored like this, just for, for convenience, because the numbers get big otherwise. 
Now, this number right here, 2 to the 5, that's, that's 32. So this number is 32. So we have negative 32 times 6 to the 4th. So this is the wrong y-intercept. It's off by a long way. So that's why we need to have this k here. So you need to have that k here, like that. So that means it's going to be k times all of this. So k times all of this. So what does that tell us? So let me just rewrite it. So we have f at x is k times x plus 2. I'm just rewriting everything x plus 1 times x minus 2 cubed times x minus 6 to the fourth. So now if x is equal to 0, that's going to give us f at 0 equals k times all of these terms, which is our negative 2 to the fifth times 6 to the fourth. And we know that this is equal to negative 32 because that's our that's our y-intercept. So y is equal to negative 32 when x is equal to 0. So that's why we know that. So what that tells us is that k times, well this is negative 32 times 6 to the fourth is equal to negative 32. Now we, we want to solve for this. So we just divide by everything here. Let me change the color. So we're just going to divide by minus 32 times 6 to the 4. And again, I'm just going to leave it as 6 to the 4. So minus 32 times 6 to the 4. This minus 32 will cancel with that minus 32. And then you're just left with 1 over 6 to the 4. And this is your value, oops, excuse me, this is your value for k. So that tells us exactly what f is. So f at x is equal to k, but k is 1 over 6 to the 4, times all this other stuff. x plus 2 squared times x plus 1 times x minus 2 cubed times x minus 6 to the 4th. We need this factor of k here just to make sure that the y-intercept is the right value. If we don't have this k here, then this, this y-intercept would be wrong, because we're told that the y-intercept is negative 32. So we need to make sure that when you plug in x equals 0, you need to get negative 32 as a result. And that's why you need this 1 over 6 to the 4 here. It's going to cancel out with this factor if you plug in x equals 0. Now keep in mind, negative 6 raised to an even power is going to be positive. So that's why there's no negative here. So this term, when you plug in x equals 0, this term will cancel with that term. And then you'll just have negative 2 to the 5, which gives you the, the 32, the, or the negative 32. Let's talk a little bit about the end behavior of the polynomial, or the polynomial function. Well, the end behavior is what happens is x increases off to infinity or decreases to negative infinity. In other words, as x moves to the right or to the left. For a polynomial function, the end behavior is determined by the leading term. So the end behavior of this polynomial is determined by a sub n times x to the n. So this determines the, the end behavior that term. It's because it, it, what we say it dominates over all of these other terms. Because no matter how big any of these are, when you're looking at x going off to infinity or negative infinity, this x to the n is just huge in comparison to all of them. Even though x to the n minus 1 is also huge, it's just nowhere near as big as x to the n. So that's why it determines the end behavior. So here's the little chart that helps you know what the end behavior is based on the leading coefficient. So the leading coefficient, if it's, if it's positive, and you have even degree, if your polynomial is even degree, and your leading coefficient is positive, then it has this overall shape at, at, at the end behavior, as, as the end behavior. So as x moves off to infinity, then y increases without bound. And as x goes to the left, y increases without bound. That's if you have an even degree. It, it's opening upwards. And the leading coefficient is positive, so everything's going up to positive infinity in the end behavior. 
if you're if you have an even degree but your leading coefficient is negative, then it's going to sort of open downwards like this. Now that's not telling us anything about what's going on in the middle. We don't know anything about what's going on in the middle, but what's going on at the ends looks like this. Now if you have odd degree, that means as x goes in one direction, you're increasing without bound, and as x goes in the other direction, you're decreasing. So if your leading coefficient is positive, then that happens with x going to the right, giving you increasing without bound. And as x goes to the left, y decreases without bound. However, if the leading coefficient is negative, then it's the reverse. If the leading coefficient is negative, then as x goes off to infinity, as x moves to the right, y decreases without bound. And as x goes to the left, y increases. That's if the leading coefficient is negative. So you can see what determines the end behavior is the degree of the polynomial and the leading coefficient being positive or negative. So our main objective was to talk about how to sketch the graph of a polynomial function. And we already laid out what exactly the steps were, but let's just revisit that. So in order to graph a polynomial function, these are the steps that we follow. Find the x-intercepts, if there are any, and the y-intercept. There will always be a y-intercept. Use the multiplicities of the zeros to determine the behavior of the polynomial at the x-intercepts. Does it pass through? Does it touch and then turn around? Does it get flat? If the multiplicity is bigger than 1, and odd, then it's then it's going to get a little, it's going to flatten out a bit, and if it's even, and bigger than two, then it will flatten out a little bit. Determine the end behavior by examining the leading term. Use the end behavior and the behavior of the intercepts to sketch a graph. If the polynomial is degree n, there are at most n minus one turning points. All right, so let's sketch a graph of a polynomial function. So this is fortunately already factored for us. If you had something like this in its general form, then it would be quite difficult to factor it, or at least it would require a certain amount of work to factor it. And uh, so it's, it's very convenient that it's given to us here in factored form. Because now we can see what the x-intercepts are immediately. So the x-intercepts are just the zeros. So there's x equals negative 3 coming from this one, and x equals 1 coming from this one, and then x equals 4 coming from that one. So what about the multiplicities? Well, the multiplicities are just the powers. So this one, the multiplicity, well, let's just write it like this. Let's just write p equals 2 for that one, and x equals 1 has p equals 3, and x equals 4 is p equals 1. So those, those are the x-intercepts in their multiplicities, but what about the y-intercept? The y-intercept we can compute just using the formula. So that's when x is equal to 0. So f at 0 is equal to 1 ninth times, and then we just plug in x equals 0 here, here, and here. So you're going to have 3 squared times negative 1 cubed times negative 4. So 0 plus 3 is 3, quantity squared. So it's 3 squared. 0 minus 1 is a negative 1, quantity cubed, which is what you see here, negative 1 cubed. And then 0 minus 4 is a negative 4. So 3 squared is 9, so this 3 squared cancels with that. So we have that f at 0 is equal to negative 1 cubed is a negative 1, and negative 4 is negative 4. So negative 1 times negative 4 is 4. So the y-intercept is y equals 4. Okay. So let's mark all of these on the graph. The y-intercept is y equals 4, right there. The x-intercepts are negative 3, 1, and 4. Now what we need to do is we need to, we, we have these dots and we need to connect the dots. But in order to do that, we have to 
know what the end behavior is, and we have to know what the multiplicities are. Well, we know that. So at x equals negative 3, the multiplicity is 2. So that means it doesn't pass through. Now, the real question is, uh, is it going to be up here? Is it going to be above the x-axis or below the x-axis? For that, we need to know what the leading term is. And to know what the leading term is, we need to know what this looks like in general form. Well, we don't need the whole thing. We just need the first term. So if we just start multiplying it out, we're going to have a 1 over 9 times x squared squared plus cubed plus 1 plus stuff plus other terms. This is the leading term right there, leading term. This 1 over 9, I'm multiplying that by x squared times x cubed times x to the 1, right? x squared, that's where this squared comes from, times x cubed, that's where that 3 comes from, times x to the 1. There's a 1 power here, so that's where that 1 comes from. So it's 1, so I'm just multiplying all these things together. 1 ninth times x squared times x cubed times x to the 1. That gives me that. So this is x to the 3, 4, 5, 6. So the leading term is 1 over 9 times x to the 6. That's the leading term. In particular, the degree is even, so that means it's going to either open upwards or open downwards, but the leading coefficient, a sub n in this case, well, n is equal to 6, but a sub n is 1 over 9, which is positive. So n is equal to 6. So you have even degree, and the leading term is positive, so that means it's going to open upwards. So that means the end behavior looks like this, like that sort of thing. OK, so now we look at the intercepts, the x-intercepts. Here's a negative 3. The multiplicity is 2. It's even. So that means it's going to be above the x-axis, because the end behavior further to the left is positive. So it's going to be above the x-axis. It's going to touch, but then it's going to just turn around like that. Then it's going to pass through x to the 4 somewhere, something like that. Who knows if it's going up or down, but it's going to pass through the, the, the y-intercept. It's going to pass through the y-axis the y right there. Now x equals 1, x equals 1 has multiplicity 3. That's an odd multiplicity. So that means it's, it's above the x-axis. The multiplicity is odd, so it's going to pass through. But it's multiplicity bigger than 1, so it's going to be flat it's going to be flattened out a little bit. So it's going to look like that. It's going to flatten just a little bit, like so. Now, x equals 4 has multiplicity 1, so it's just going to pass through like that. So now what we want to do is we want to connect all of these pieces. So let me actually do it with a different... Actually, let's do it. This so it's going to go down like this. It's going to connect. Then it's going to go... Now, we don't really know what it looks like here, but I know that it's immediately going to drop down like this. So I'm thinking it's probably going to go up above it, down like that. This is just a guess. And then we're just connecting like so. Now, based on the information that we have, this is the best that we can do we would have to explore other properties of the function before we could determine how accurate this graph is. One thing we could do is we could plot a few more points, but we're just asked to sketch a graph. So we've got, roughly speaking, the local behavior, and we've got the end behavior, and that's really all that we're looking for at this time. Implicitly, we're using something called the intermediate value theorem. Suppose that a function is a polynomial function and you have a and b where a is less than b. If a, f at a is not equal to f at b, so if these two output values are not the same, then f attains every value between. 
Now, essentially what this is telling us is that when we're graphing a polynomial function, we need to collect, <laughs> this is not supposed to be collect, it's supposed to be connect. We need to connect all the dots with an unbroken curve. So here's a, here's a point on the curve and here's another point on the curve. So what the intermediate value theorem tells me is that it achieves all of the intermediate values. Inter intermediate just means in between. So the curve passes through all of the intermediate values. Now we don't know how it passes through. It might shoot up and then come down. It might go down and then go up. But what we do know is if it passes through this point and it passes through this point, then those two are connected by an unbroken curve. So that's what we're using implicitly when we're graphing here, because I know that it passes through these points. I know that it passes through these intercepts, and I know what the end behavior is. So when I connect all of these pieces together, I do it with an unbroken curve. And that's what the intermediate value theorem is telling us. It's just telling us that when you connect these, do it with an unbroken curve. When you connect all the dots. Let's do another example here. So once again, it's already factored for us. So the x-intercepts, we can write down. So this, is, this one's going to give us x equals 0 as an x-intercept. And then this one's going to give us x equals 2. And then this one gives us x equals negative 4. So 0, 2, and negative 4. And we can also read off the multiplicities. The multiplicity for x equals 0 is 3. And for the others, it's just 1. I guess I should say p equals 1 and p equals 1. Because the, the exponents here are, are 1. Oops. Now what about the y-intercept? Well, in this case, the y-intercept is easy because we're looking at when x is equal to 0. And that's easy in this case because there's a 0 right here. If x is equal to 0, then you have 0 times negative 2 times 4. So it's just going to, well, let's write that out. 0 times negative 2 times 4. But of course, that's just going to be equal to 0. So this point is an x-intercept and also a y-intercept because it's passing through the origin. Well, is it passing through or is it just touching? Let's find out. Well, that's based on the multiplicities. So this multiplicity, the multiplicity here is odd, so that means it's going to pass through. Actually, it's going to pass through all of these, because all of these multiplicities are odd. So it's going to pass through all of these. But here it's multiplicity 3, so it's going to flatten out a little bit. So it's going to, it's going to flatten out just a little bit. Now we need to know what the end behavior is, because is it going to, if we look at this negative 4, is it going to pass through that way, or is it going to pass through this way? In order to know that, we need to know what the end behavior is. So this polynomial, what kind of degree does it have? Well, let's see, this is 3 plus 1 plus 1. So it's, it's odd degree. But importantly, the leading term is going to be negative. It's going to have a negative coefficient. So this is going to be negative 2x to the 5 plus other terms. So this is the leading term right there. Let's just write it over here, leading term is negative 2x to the 5. Okay, so there's a negative in front of it. So what that what does that mean? That means the end behavior tells us that the end behavior is like this function. So in particular, it's got a negative in front of it. So that means as x goes to the right, you're going to decrease. The y values are going to decrease. But this is an odd function. This is an, this is an odd polynomial function. So that means it does the opposite on the opposite side. So as x moves to the right, you're decreasing. And that means as x moves to the left, you're increasing. Okay? So it's so n is odd in this case. n equals 5 is odd. And a sub n is negative 2. It's negative. So if you go back to your chart, it looks like this. So it's odd degree and negative. So it's going to have that basic shape. Now the basic idea, you know, if you just want to remember how this works, as x goes to the right, x is a positive number. So x to the 5 is a positive number. 
but when you multiply it by a negative, it becomes negative, so it's down here. Now on the other end, as x goes to the left, x is negative. So you have a negative number, and you're raising it to the fifth power. That's an odd power, so it's still negative. So x to the fifth will be negative over here. But then if you multiply it by a negative number, a negative times a negative is positive. So that's why it's above the x-axis. And again, now we just want to connect all of these dots. We remind ourselves that all of the multiplicities are odd, so that means it's always going to pass through. So it's going to pass through here. It's going to then pass through here, but it's going to flatten out a bit. And then it's going to pass through here. So now we just connect all the dots. We do it in an unbroken curve because of the intermediate value theorem. So it's going to go around like this. When you have an unbroken curve like this, the function is said to be what we, it's, it's what we call continuous. So polynomials are continuous. So this one, I sort of messed up a little bit right around here, but so it's it's going to be like it's going to be more like that. I think. There we are. So that, roughly speaking, is what the graph looks like. Again, I don't know how accurate this is, because I don't know how far down this goes. It might look like that, and it might then you know, level out a little bit. Go, it might go all the way up to here and then drop down. This is really just a guess. Without more information, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but it's only asking me to sketch the graph, just to sketch the graph. So that means identify what the end behavior is and identify what the local behavior is, and we've done that.